Okay, so we're going to continue with chapter one notes with the male. So we're going to start with just quickly reviewing the anatomy of the testy. Get something to write with down here. So again, this is the testy. The testy sits outside of the body in the scrotum. Um, the testy is surrounded by two connective tissue sheaths. The outer one is the tunica vaginal. The inner one is the tunica albuginea. The tunica albuginea comes into the testi and separates the testi into these little sections that are called lobules. So the septa, all right, are the pieces of the tunica albuginea that come in here to separate the um, testes into lobules. And then in, inside the lobules, we have anywhere from one to four seminiferous tubules where sperm are produced. Once sperm are produced in the walls of the seminiferous tubules, they're pushed into the lumen, and then they move via peristalsis to an area called the retestis, which is responsible for absorbing excess water. Um, after the retestis, sperm then move in the epididymis. The epididymis um, is where sperm are being pushed again via peristalsis, and they're going through a process of sperm maturation because when sperm are produced back in the seminiferous tubules, they don't look like the sperm that you think of with a head, midpiece, and tail. Um, they are very juvenile. And so as they're moving through the epididymis, and it takes them quite a long time, actually, um, they're going to go through a process of sperm neogenesis. And, and I did briefly talk about um, the spermatic cord, and the spermatic cord holds essentially the vas deferens, nervous supply, as well as um, blood vessels, and that the venous blood supply actually wraps around the arterial blood supply to cool it down, to cool blood as it comes into the testes um, to create optimal, um, the optimal temperature for sperm production. So I told you that there is a duct system, all right, that um, brings uh, semen from inside of the body to the outside. Uh, it starts with the epididymis. Again, that's where sperm are stored until ejaculation occurs. If ejaculation doesn't occur, then the sperm are just going to be phagocytized and broken down. Um, sperm then will pass via peristalsis through the vas deferens, and then they will go to the urethra. And as we talked about in the urinary system, the urethra in males has three different parts, the prosthetic, membranous, and spongy or penile urethra. Um, sperm are not swimming through the male reproductive tract. They are being pushed via peristaltic waves. Um, if a man was to get a vasectomy, then this is will actually be um, cut off um, and tied up. So as you can see, we didn't talk about the testes. So when a male gets a vasectomy, they are not getting their testes removed. They are having the vas deferens cut. So vasectomy. So vas means vas deferens, ectomy means cut. The function of the duct system is to bring sperm from the testes to the outside of the body. Um, and as we know, the urethra functions to empty urine from the bladder. So the epididymis is about six meters in length, which is crazy. Um, but it's coiled up to about 1.5 inches. So we've got 20 feet coiled up into 1.5 inches. That's kind of mind boggling. And again, it's a temporary storage site for immature sperm. They move through, through um, from the seminiferous tubules to the epididymis via peristalsis. And then it takes them about 20 days to go through the epididymis. And during that time, they go through, I call it like Native American societies when, you know, they would send young warriors out into the woods to become quote unquote men, like a vision quest or a vision walk. This is what is happening to sperm in the epididymis. They are becoming young men sperm. Um, they are um, becoming stronger and sleeker, and they are losing excess baby fat by way of excess cytoplasm and organelles, and they are also gaining the ability to swim. So the vas deferens, um, it's the responsibility of the vas deferens to transmit or, or bring sperm from the epididymis to the urethra. Um, it comes out of 
the testes loops up and over the bladder, which is really funny to me. And then you have your right and left vas deferens that converge into an area called the ejaculatory duct. At this site, this is where um, a couple other structures, which we call accessory glands, are going to input um, their materials for seminal fluid. And then from the vas deferens to the ejaculatory duct, um, semen will then go to the urethra and then out of the body. So what did I just say? So again, here are the testes sitting in the sort of outside of the body. In this picture, the epididymis looks like a baby bonnet, which is just kind of funny to me. But um, so in this person, as you can see, they've had a vasectomy. So vasectomies do not affect the actual production of sperm. And basically, are just cutting the duct system so that sperm can't get outside of the body. Um, so in the vas deferens, I'm sorry, in the epididymis, that is where sperm is going to be stored. And then when ejaculation occurs, they come and into the vas deferens, make their loop-de-loop -loop up around the bladder. And as you can see, your right and left vas deferens converge here. This area would be called the ejaculatory duct. And I'm going to change colors here. So you have this here and this here. These are called seminal vesicles. Um, this is our first accessory gland. And seminal vesicles actually produce the bulk of seminal fluid or semen. So in semen, we have two different things. We have actual sperm and we have seminal fluid. And sperm cannot live without seminal fluid. Um, then from the vas deferens and ejaculatory duct inside of here, this is the prostate gland, would be the prosthetic urethra, which would then bring semen down to, this is the membranous urethra, and then again, we've got the penile urethra here. So I think the cross sections are kind of easier to understand. So here is your testes, here's your epididymis. Miss sperm are going to be stored for about 20 days. Um, and then ejaculation occurs, they're going to be pushed via peristalsis up through the vas deferens, up around the bladder, and then to the ejaculatory duct. They're going to receive excess fluid from the seminal vesicle, from the prostate gland, and then from this gland right here which is called bulbo gland. That's a really fun one to say, bulbo gland. So we have three accessory glands. So what does the accessory mean? It means that semen doesn't actually go, you know, through them, but they are responsible for producing seminal fluid. The urethra, as we talked about in chapter 15, has two functions for men, to move urine and sperm to the outside of the body, but this cannot occur simultaneously. So there is a sphincter that essentially closes up to prevent urine from coming out at the same time as um, semen. Three different areas to the urethra, so it's one continuous tube, but it has three different sections. Um, like I explained, much like the pharynx, how we had the nasal pharynx, the oral pharynx, the laryngeal pharynx, same concept here with the urethra. You've got the prosthetic, membranous, and spongy urethra. So here's the bladder. I'm going to change my color here so it's a little darker. So here's the bladder. And if you remember, we talked about that trigon, which was that, you know, area of interest that Bermuda Triangle of the bladder because this is where you have your ureter, ureter, and urethral opening. Um, so here would be your prosthetic urethra. This would be the very small mess urethra. And then the penile urethra would run the length of penis. So I have mentioned this term, accessory glands. So what accessory glands are responsible for are producing seminal fluid. And again, sperm cannot live without seminal fluid. 
The seminal vesicles are responsible for producing the bulk of, of some fluid, about 60% of it. Um, in that, it's kind of like, I like to think of it like a, a Mountain Dew energy drink. So it's going to produce sugar, so glucose and fructose. And we know that sperm can use that to make ATP, vitamin C, um, and prostaglandins. And what those prostaglandins are going to do is that um, they are going to have a localized effect on the cervix of the female to dilate it. The cervix is the opening of the uterus. Um, there's an old wives tale for women who might be trying to induce labor um, that if they have um, intercourse uh, with ejaculation that uh, the prostaglandins from semen can have an effect on, you know, opening the cervix and, you know, trying to get labor going. So seminal vesicles sit, uh, if this is the posterior aspect of the bladder, they sit like this. And you have the vas deferens that are going to come down like this and meet. And then the seminal vesicles are going to meet and they all become this area called the ejaculatory duct. The prostate gland, as we know, is like a donut and it sits around the prosthetic urethra. It produces a substance that activates sperm. And then we have small bulbo urethral gland. Um, and this actually produces the thick, clear mucus that will, if you remember from chapter 15, urine is actually supposed to be slightly acidic. It's supposed to have a pH of six. Um, semen actually has an alkaline or more basic consistency to it. And that's because sperm motility is actually better um, with a basic pH. Um, the pH of the vagina is like three or four. And so when sperm are ejaculated in the vagina, there it's like a, an acid shock to them. Um, and so what the bulbourethral gland does is that it provides this this mucus, this basic mucus that's going to essentially clean the urethra of any acidic urine um, because you already don't need the sperm, you know, essentially lazy prior to going into the vagina because their job is, you know, to fertilize the egg. So this would be um, kind of a close up. So like this would be the, the, the bladder. Um, Oh, that was a really big drawing of the blur. Let me undo that. This would be the bladder, like this. And that'd be where everything is meeting at the posterior. And this is on the posterior side or the back of the bladder. So you have semen coming from the epididymis here. Right and left vest deferons are going to meet. The seminal vesicles are going to input their material as well as the prostate gland. Um, and then we're going to move into the prosthetic urethra. So if I'm going to, you know, circle the three accessory glands, I'm going to say that we have the seminal vesicle here, that we have the prostate gland, and that we have the bulbo ural gland. And again, they're responsible for producing seminal fluid, which is the medium with which sperm travels. Sperm absolutely needs semen. It has to have seminal fluid. Why? It needs to get its nutrients. It needs to have a transport medium just in general. Um, it needs to be activated. It also needs help kind of fending off the acidic environment which could happen both in the urethra and the female reproductive anatomy. And then the exterior structures of the male reproductive system are the penis and the scrotum. The penis's job is essentially to get semen as close as possible to the egg. So that's its sole purpose, to, to be a deliverer. And then as we talked about, the scrotum is responsible for holding testes um, outside of the body um, so that effectively um, the temperature of the testes